cancel Joe Nami. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Um, I am here. What is happening in the world? Russia. I think I mentioned Russia on the last episode, but they are thinking about invading the Ukraine. That's fun. Um, Putin uh, wants to expand the evil empire. Um, No, I'm joking. I mean, they can't, you know, they can't really be evil. I mean, he probably as an individual is evil, but, you know, I would be biased to say that the empire is evil. Soviet Union, they were a thing. What I want to talk about. Oh, you know what's kind of interesting? I was, I've was i been watching this World War II stuff lately, and I guess this is the story. I was going to start with a personal anecdote, but I can't remember what the fuck happened yesterday. I, uh, I did... Some comedy in Astoria. Then I, oh, you know what did happen? I w- we went to Chipotle. My buddy Mike Early and I went to Chipotle, and there was like a buy one get one free on the app. You had to get a plant based chorizo burrito. It wasn't that great, but uh, then we split the cost of it, and uh, they messed up our order, and so I, I they couldn't find the order, and I told the woman. Behind the desk, I said, you know, we're long time Chipotle. We're very loyal customers. You know, like you really need to fix this order for us. We're really good people for the brands. You know, I, I, I told the woman, I said, I don't eat anywhere else. <laughs> I said, and people who eat burritos from other places, I told her, I hurt them. I hurt those people. And uh, she seemed a little concerned. <laughs> and uh, then they got it. They gave us some burritos, you know, and that's that's what you got to do. You know, you got to really show them that you are fucking serious about brand loyalty, you know, and um, it doesn't matter if there's mom and pop shops. It doesn't matter if there's, you know, little Mexican families making burritos. Chipotle is a corporation. And they shall reign supreme. Then after we got burritos, I went to um, the drugstore and I used my food stamps to get a bunch of candy. <laughs> we got, um, what candy did I get? Sweet tart ropes, which were pretty good. And then, uh, and then Hai Chu, the candy from Taiwan, actually. It's made in Japan, I think, but it's also made in Taiwan, really. That's what it says on the back of the bag. Now, the interesting thing, first of all, Taiwan is officially not a country, according to China. China says, no can do. If you... Like John Cena, the guy from Fast and the Furious, he accidentally said Taiwan would be the first country to see the new Fast 9 movie. And uh, he got in a lot of trouble. China got really upset. And even in the United Nations, you can't acknowledge Taiwan as a country or China will get really angry. Um, I don't know why they're so touchy about this tiny island. They, They really need to check their ego. But anyways, this candy is made in not a country, Taiwan, and uh, it's rather good. And we get up to the register, and I go to purchase it, and uh, I ask the cashier, I was like, do you take EBT? He goes, yeah. I go, oh, good, thank you. You know, I I have EBT because I'm mentally ill, and, um, and I need this candy because, you know, me and my friend here, we don't drink alcohol anymore. So uh, we just eat a lot of candy instead of doing drugs and alcohol. And he said, cool, man. And uh, (laughs) I don't think he was listening to me. (laughs) 
you know, it's so tough to build rapport with cashiers these days. But um, yeah, anyways, I want to make a hard transition into uh, World War II now. I was watching this movie the other night, um, Fury. It's a World War II tank movie. It's really good. I really encourage you to watch it. It was fascinating. It was violent. It was another perspective on World War II. I hadn't seen a film that really dove into the point of view of the tanks. And fighting from tanks is actually really fascinating. I didn't know you could fit like five men down inside the tank and um, you could hang out in there. You could sleep in there. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do <laughs> inside of the tank. You could have a party. Um, you know, there's a little space where you can put food. I mean, it's like the inside of a tank is like an apartment that you don't even have to pay rent for. Um, so I don't know. I could see myself living in a tank <laughs> and just sort of, you know, rolling the tank around the Ukraine, trying to defend them from Russia. But um, watch the movie. Great movie. Brad Pitt's in it. Handsome man. Handsome man. Um, what else? There was, they were fighting, I think in France, and they were creeping up on Germany towards the end of the war, which even in 1944 and uh, 1945, I, I thought that the war was over by then, but Hitler was just like not giving up, man. That guy, you know, you got to respect his hustle, Hitler's hustle. Um, <laughs> he hustled those Jews out real fast. But um, so the movie covered that. There was a great quote from the movie that was like, um, ideals are peaceful, but history is violent. And I really liked that uh, quote of dialogue. I think it kind of represents humanity rather well, you know, the sort of cognitive dissonance that we hold between our ideals and the reality of human nature. You know, I've thought about like, you know, communism in theory, it's great. It's a great system. You know, oh, everybody gets something, you know, nobody's left homeless or between the cracks and there's no evil billionaires manipulating everything, but in reality, a lot of people just stop working. And the only way, you know, it, a lot of people aren't motivated, unfortunately. And then also the only way to really implement communism is with a gun, you know, so then it just ends up being a really violent process to initiate equality. Uh, so I don't think that helps. But uh, I am reading a book about Marxism just to try to educate myself on the matter and see what's going on there. The last thing I remember was that Marx was saying, Karl Marx, that is not uh, the Marx brothers. Karl Marx was saying that the problem with goods is then they... Or the labor of what you do, the labor of what you do then becomes a product. But the problem is that product then has its own value, which then manipulates and outpowers you, the worker. And in many ways, that seeds a lot of the problems of capitalism. Um, is then, you know, the goods become more valuable than the workers. And we as human beings sort of get squeezed out. Um, in many ways, but I don't know, man, there's no perfect system. Um, ask Jeff Bezos what he thinks. <laughs> Jeff Bezos is a tiny billionaire. He's a tiny little bald billionaire. But um, anyways, getting back to World War II. So this is kind of interesting is <clears throat> there's this one battle called there's a city in France called Metz with a Z, like the New York baseball team, but with a Z, very more French, and they're actually much better at baseball there. <laughs> um, so the Americans had their tanks, and they were trying to overtake the city of Metz so that eventually they could get to Germany, 
with the tanks, but the Germans had this underground fort. Fucking crazy, man. They had these like little um, guns sticking up from the out of the ground. So they weren't exposed. It was an underground fort. It was called Fort Driant with a D. <laughs> and uh, the Germans were all hiding underneath it. And so when General Patton tried to creep up on them with the tanks and do his sort of like full on assault, the Germans were just shooting them and you, you couldn't really get to them. And uh, the underground fort was reinforced with like six or seven feet of fucking some kind of strong concrete titanium something. So even when they dropped bombs on it, um, they couldn't even crack it open. So General Patton had to adjust his strategy instead of being like sort of full on assault. Um, he had to kind of be sneaky, come from the sides, try to bomb different parts out, try to circle around, ferret them out, smoke them, throw grenades in, you know, just a little bit more guerrilla warfare. And um, yeah, man, it's just fascinating. Even the Germans at that point, they knew they were losing the war, but they were still screaming, Heil Hitler! And they were just really passionate <laughs> about Germany, even when they knew that they couldn't win. They knew that they were losing. And uh, some of them surrendered, though. That was interesting. I don't know how they surrounded some of these forts. That, and there was like... There was like seven of these underground forts all kind of pointing and like backing each other up. You know, one would be covering the other. So like they were well strategized underground fort um, would make for a great apartment on Zillow. Um, check the Zillow. That's always fun. I like to check and see how much my neighbors are paying for their six thousand dollar Manhattan apartment. It's crazy, man, how much money people have and how much money I don't have. It's baffling. You know, some of these people, too, come from trust funds. This is kind of interesting. My friend's a lawyer. Um, he's a comic and a lawyer. And he writes, I don't know if he writes, but he knows some of these people that write the trust funds. And uh, but these trust funds have a lot of stipulations. Like, the rich parents will be like, when you turn 30, you'll get this trust fund money, but you have to, you know, graduate from an Ivy League school and maintain a GPA of this. And you have to be engaged to such and so, you know, there's all these stipulations to trust funds for receiving the money. And it dawned on me that uh, there's a lot of distrust in these funds. You know, rich people don't trust each other, even when they're related. It's kind of funny. They're always writing each other out of the wills. <laughs> You know, that's kind of the nice thing about us poor people is I don't have to worry, will my dad write me out of the will? Because it doesn't matter because we're poor. So inherently, there's more trust among us. I like that. Poor people trust each other more. Poor trust. Yeah, but uh, World War Two. back to that. You know, that story went by a lot faster than I thought it was going. I thought the whole story was going to take longer, but it was just like, yeah, there's a fort and there's some tanks and blah, blah, blah. How did they do it? The Germans had some big-ass tanks, though. Their tanks were even better. I think they were called Panzers, German Panzer tanks, and they were much stronger than the American tanks. Like, they could take quite a few shots. 75 millimeter barrel fucking guns on the American tanks. Oh, they had uh, an all-black tank. That was cool. These guys were from Harlem. It's kind of a bummer. Back then, blacks couldn't join. One of the Blacks wanted to be a pilot, and he couldn't because in 1944, there were no black pilots, um, which is a bummer. Uh, General Patton, fierce general of the American military, but it was also kind of a racist guy. He said that colored 
people were on individually they were great soldiers but uh, as a unit they just couldn't think as fast as white soldiers so he preferred the white soldiers um kind of crazy what that evidence was probably based on it's probably just based on his own, his own anecdotal evidence you know what i mean like couched behind some confirmation bias it's amazing how much racism uh is just couched on very little empirical data i'm trying to make this uh podcast a little humorous today struggling because i was up late watching the ultimate fighting championship uh, until like one in the morning at a bar in new york city and there was two african champions francis nuganu versus sita lugan and it was uh it was nice watching French, African, cage fighting. Felt like uh like Django on chain. Like I was watching uh the Mun he's got a word in there, like Mundango fights or something. Mandingo, Mandingo fights. I don't know. Mandingo. Oh, you know what I wanted to mention that in the 1940s, there were a lot of reports from American pilots about UFOs back then. And the UFOs, unidentified flying objects, were nicknamed Foo Fighters, which is where the band, the Foo Fighters, gets their name from, I think. There's a couple of explanations, though, for these. Uh, the Germans reportedly were releasing, uh, like, uh, no, helium and hydrogen and fucking, like, methane balls. They were releasing some weird chemicals in, like, these balloons to try to fuck with the pilots because if the balloon filled with this chemical would hit your plane it could fuck up your plane and these chemicals kind of produced a halo like effect uh it kind of looked like an unidentified flying object but that being said i do i am seeing a lot more evidence i want to do a whole episode about this but i was kind of wrong about I did a whole episode about UFOs, and I think that I was kind of wrong. I mean, I've just been learning more. So that was as much as I knew then, but I'm learning that um, there are... So this is kind of interesting, actually. After World War II, and then we started seeing the rates of unidentified flying objects spiked after World War II, specifically after we started using nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and the rumor is that these nuclear weapons attracted more UFOs. Like, oh, look, these humans are using nuclear weapons. What the hell's going on here? And there was a dramatic increase and there was about 12,000 UFO sightings reported and the U.S. military created this group called Project Blue Book, which was the group that was designed to investigate all of these UFO sightings unidentified. Um, and most of them were explainable. Most of them were, you know, either hydrogen or um, another phenomenon known as swamp gas, which is where different chemical elements and temperatures get trapped in the atmosphere and create um, visual and uh, aesthetic images. Not images, but you know what I mean, like sightings. Um, but 
of these 12,000 UFO sightings, there was about 750 or so that were completely unexplainable. You know, objects moving in directions that chemical elements would not be moving. There's another phenomenon called ball lightning, which is where lightning can, because of the way the electrons are charged, uh, the lightning gathers into sort of a spherical shape. Um, and it can appear like a UFO. It can move like, you know. But it's different when you see like a f when certain airplanes and pilots report metallic disc-shaped flying aerial phenomenons. That's a little bit different, though, because then you're dealing with something that looks um, metallic in nature. You know, I think it's a little easier to decipher between that and ball lightning, which is just sort of, uh, I don't know, sort of this infrared halo sort of light effect. But yeah, Google it. There's some interesting, on YouTube, there's some interesting videos of this rare phenomenon called ball lightning that's not really well understood by scientists yet. But in addition to this, there are about 700 cases of actual UFOs, um, which is just to say we don't know what they are. But, you know, when they're moving left, right, up, down, they're moving at um, 5,000 kilometers per hour. They're, I mean, it's, they're moving intelligently, um, which is to say that they're sort of mirroring or they're reflexive, reflexive of the way different pilots are moving. They're making 90 degree turns in the sky. I mean, it's fucking, it's weird stuff, you know? So it's either advanced technology, foreign technology, secret U.S. technology, or the genuine extraterrestrial article. But the thing is, you know, the most famous incident of recent years was the one, the USS Nimitz carrier ship that has jet planes that land, U.S. Air Force jet planes that land on it and take off of it. Uh, this was about 100 miles west of San Diego and Catalina Island, um, where the commander Air Force pilot David Fravor, um, and these people are high-level trained observers, observed a spherical tic-tac-shaped UFO that was traveling at, I don't know, Mach 3, making 90 degree turns, zipping around. And it was also, so, it, and here's the thing. I don't think just a picture, you know, a grainy picture of a UFO proves the situation. But when you've got a picture plus a pilot report, plus radar readings, plus he also reported that there was white water created on the surface of the Pacific Ocean from this craft, which that can only happen if there's physical matter interacting with the surface of the water. Um, you know, multiply that by 700 sightings. I mean, if you really dig in, there's, there's a lot of credible sightings now. And I'm not saying that this is extraterrestrial. Um, it very well could be. I mean, I think it's stupid to say that we are alone in this universe because life is a chemical process. Um, in 1955, I think, I might be slightly off with the year, but I mean, even now, there are a bunch of, it's called the Miller-Urey experiment, and they were able to show how in sort of primordial, you know, early earth atmosphere where you've got high levels of iron and carbon and methane and different um, gases in the atmosphere, mix that with lightning, mix that with volcanoes, um, which was also, we know the early earth atmosphere was really like there was a lot of molten lava. It was a really hostile 
environment initially to life, which is why I think like the first, mm, I think it's like the first, I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> it's 4 billion years. Fuck. I know the universe is 13 point something billion years old. I forget how old the earth is, but um, yeah, the Miller-Urey experiment showed though how inorganic compounds could then transition into organic proteins through the mix of these early atmosphere gases plus the electrical charge of lightning and the heat of molten lava. I don't know. It's a weird thing. And then it started as, you know, uh, paramecium, which are single-celled organisms, and then, you know, to fish, and then evolution, you know, everybody has a spine, you know, and now you got monkeys. <laughs> um, I like monkeys. I can't wait for the monkeys to start flying things. I got a joke that I've been working on that's like, you know, there was that gorilla Coco, right? There's a gorilla, Coco, that a scientist taught this gorilla uh, 3,000 words. Now, you can argue whether the gorilla actually knew this or if it was just repeating sentences and phrases and words, you know, for bananas. Uh, apes will learn anything for bananas. But the gorilla, Coco, they taught it sign language and it knew thousands of words. And I always wanted the scientists to go further, you know, and one day tell Coco, you know, so, hey, Coco... You know, and they use sign language and they'd be like, so we humans, we actually evolved from you primates um, through this process called evolution. And I always like to imagine that Coco would respond in sign language and go, I don't believe in evolution. I believe in the Bible <laughs> and gay marriage is a sin, you know, because even if apes are evolving, they're going to go through their own, um, you know, Medieval times and dark ages, you know, pre-civilization, you know, where they still are developing a system of morality. And, you know, at first they're going to believe in magic and witchcraft. You know, we burned witches at the stake for a long time because that's how we that's how we thought science worked. <laughs> you know, if someone possesses witchery, you burn them. I mean, it's just obvious. That's how you fire destroys bad things. Um you know, so apes are going to go through a primitive period, maybe, but um, where they're developing systems of logic, and then you're going to end up with an ape eventually that, you know, has Freudian theories and an ape. I mean, bonobos actually do fuck their relatives, so I'm sure there will be a Freudian ape at some point. Um, apes are also entering the Stone Age currently. They're using uh, stone tools to make like flints and you know some of them are even performing brain surgeries oh, i'm joking they're just beating each other to death with stones um <laughs> but yeah it's interesting to see like okay apes are in the stone age all right they're using tools they're using branches to get food out of uh ant hills or whatever you know they're they they have a complex social environment you know they they live in tribes of 30 to 150 and you know these complex social systems are something that's helping evolve their brains i mean it's i'm fascinated to see what the next step is going to be you know are apes going to be playing with fire um we've already seen some pictures in the news of apes you know you always see a chimpanzee at the zoo smoking a cigarette i mean that that if that's not evolution man i don't i don't know what is <laughs> Will you have, uh, you know, an ape that, uh, will you have an ape like Darwin, you know, the first Darwin ape that writes a book about evolution? He's like, hey, I think we evolved from, uh, from monkeys and dinosaurs and chimps and fish and shit, you know. You know, then they're going to, they're going to move through history. So there's going to be like a King Louis ape. You know, who makes a, you know, they're, they're going to go through monarchies and uh, there's going to be an Alexander the Great ape who conquers all the other apes. And then there is going to be, uh, 
an Einstein ape that figures out general relativity and marries his cousin, you know, because he's a bonobo. Um, and Einstein also married his cousin, you know. Um, and Darwin also married his cousin. <laughs> so, I mean, I could see the connection here between apes and these guys already. Um, and then there's going to be, uh, you know, uh, an ape that's kind of like uh, Osama bin Laden, you know, and he's kind of got this primitive science called Islam, <laughs> and then he does terrorist. You know, apes are going to go through all these stages. I mean, some humans are still going through these stages. So it's fascinating to think that some humans are still not evolving <laughs> mentally, you know, like Osama bin Laden, uh, who is dead and buried at sea, which is kind of exciting. Oh, you know what's also interesting? Um, zipping around here, a lot of these UFOs that were spotted off the USS Nimitz, the naval carrier, as well as the USS Princeton on the East Coast, or maybe it was the USS Roosevelt, um, a lot of times they spot these UFOs going under the water. They submerge, and they're also present in highly electromagnetic field. So I'm wondering if that is powering these ships. Um, and if you think I'm crazy, go look at the Pentagon, go look at the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. If you just scratch beneath the surface, you'll see that there's a lot of empirical evidence about this. It's not just crazy people. Um, it's not just fucking baboons in the woods. It's not just monkeys. So I'm wondering if the UFOs are going under the water, though, where bin Laden is buried. <laughs> and they're using bin Laden's body um, somehow. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. I'm just babbling nonsense. Um, then there's this rumor. So there was a huge sighting of you. This podcast is going a little bit long because I'm getting excited talking about UFOs. This, there was a huge UFO sighting in the Rendlesham Forest in the United Kingdom at a United States military base where we kept nuclear weapons that were designed to be used on Germany if needed. Which, if you kind of think about it, like, why didn't we use a nuclear weapon, a nuclear bomb on Germany? We did it to Japan, but we were like, you know what, let's take our time with Hitler. Um, Maybe they wanted to bring Hitler to trial or something, and they didn't want to blow him up. Um, which there was a rumor, actually, that the Soviets had a special KGB group that went in and excavated um, Hitler's body, and they took him back to Russia. Because a big reason that Hitler lost was because he burned a lot of his resources. He had a... He had a um, neutral, a neutrality contract with Stalin that he wasn't going to invade Russia. And then he nagged on that deal. Just like, come on, dude, really? You're going to burn your buddy with the mustache? Stalin had a mustache. You have a mustache. You guys could have been evil empire, you know, people together. And he turned and he tried to invade Russia. But the German forces, the Russians kept retreating and burning the villages behind them so that there was no housing that the Germans could keep themselves warm in during the Russian winter. So the Russian, uh, the Germans kept advancing into the cold Russian winter, but they were just approaching barren land because everything the, the Russians would take the food, they'd take all the resources, they'd take uh, all the civilians, and they would just keep retreating deeper and deeper into Russia. And the Germans tried and they, a lot of them died of starvation and frostbite. Yeah, man, you don't want to fuck with the Russian winter. Those Russians know how to survive in the winter. But where am I going with all this? Well, um, I'm going to have to continue this episode next time because uh, I'm getting tired. And you have been here a long time. We've been together for a long time. And we shall talk more about all of these things next time. Thank you.